So, um, he just came in. Uh, so let's go through the the test, and then uh, okay. So we we'll review the test. Then we're gonna. I I talked a little bit about labs, but we're gonna we're going to next not next week, but the week after next when we come back. So lab. Six, you can hand in as is, or you've already handed it in, but I will do it again. Hopefully with better results. And we'll do lab seven the following week, and after that, we're going to do the project. And I'm going to talk about the project when we come back after the, uh, after the um, break. So we're going to introduce the project, work on it a little bit, but that's what we're going to do. And then, and then also, we're going to, today, we're going to do this video. And at the end, there's going to be quiz six and it's the what is the license plate of the presenter and also a plus additional that's worth 20 points so it's just a fact what's the license plate number of his of his license plate and also 10 points if you can the significance of why he uses that as his license plate. Now, that'll give you a little bit extra boost on your quizzes, okay? Any questions about that? So after we get through the quiz, the test results, and everybody gets settled with that, we're going to watch this, this video, okay? And we may not be able to get it all the way through today, but anyway, we'll try. So number one, you have 24 volts, and you have the initial conditions. When you close the switch, what happens? Well, you've got a 4K and you've got an 8K, then you have a capacitor, and you've got another 8K. All right, so what happens? Initially, this has zero volts across it. Well, if it has zero volts across it, it's like it's shorted, and that gives these, these, then these would be, should be, this would be like 4K, this would be like a 4K circuit. This would be this kind of a circuit right here. 4K up here, 4K down here, and 24 volts. 4K up here, 4K down here, all right? This is shorted. This would be like it's shorted. So that gives you 8K in parallel with 8K or 4K. So what would be the voltage across each? 12, 12. So you'd have 12 volts across this, 12 volts across this, 12 volts across this, zero volts across there. That's your answer. Number two, what would be the combined of this? So it's basically the same as resistors. Resistors and inductors are the same, so it would be the same kind of thing. This is 4, this is 12, this is 6, this is 10. So the 10 and the 6 become a 16, the 16 and the 12 are in parallel. So 16 parallel with 12 plus 4, which gives me a total of 10.85. So this would be the 1 over rule, 1 over rule, 1 over 16 plus 1 over 12, or you could go 16 times 12 over 16 plus 12, either way it works. Any questions so far? Number three, I should have drawn the picture. I think most of you like pictures, and I didn't draw the picture this time, but this is what it has, 24 volts, and you have up here, transformer. Transformers are easy. Okay, so I gave you everything that you need. I gave you a 4 to 1 step down. This is 100 ohm over here. 24 volts becomes 6 volts over here. 6 volts divided by 100 ohms gives me my current over here, my I2, which is equal to 60 milliamps. That's 60 milliamps right there. Teeter-totter rule says big, little, little, big. So do you divide or do you multiply to get the current over here? You divide 60 divided by 4 is a current over here or 15 milliamps. Any questions about that? Four. Four. V of T is equal to 10 plus 2 sine of 2 pi times 480T minus 45 degrees. Phase shift. There's my phase shift. Is 
This is my frequency. This is my um, AC voltage. My offset. And 1 over 480 is my period. And that's equal to 2.08 millihertz, or excuse me, kilohertz. Ted? Kilohertz. Number five. Number five is basically, can you add three numbers up based on a series connection? So it's J150 plus 250 minus J670, which is equal to uh, 570, 576.97 of angle minus 64.32. Number six, parallel circuit, 10 volts, And I've got a capacitor, I've got a resistor, and I've got an inductor. 10 volts. Minus J 3K, 2.5K, J 1.5K. What's the current through each of these? Well, it's 10 divided by minus J 3K through that one. It's 10 divided by 2.5K for that one. It's, it's 10 divided by J 1.5K for that one. So what are they? This is 3.3 milliamp at angle 90. This is um, 4 milliamp. And this one is 6.67 milliamp at minus 90. You add those three up, you get I total is equal to 5.20 at minus 39.77 degrees. Any questions? About that one, then you show it as a down here. So the one is 3.33. That's my I sub C. My I sub L is down like this. And my I sub R is like that. And my total is like this. Number seven. Okay, so for the circuit below, determine the voltages across the capacitor, resistor, and inductor. So in order to do that, I have to find the voltage at that critical point, which is that intermediate point. So I have to find this, which is 120 at angle 36.86. Then I use voltage divider. VR is equal to VL, which is equal to 7 times that 120 at angle 36.86 over 120 at angle 36.86 minus J250, which is that right up there. So that's voltage divider. And what is that voltage? What does that equal? 4.153 at angle 98.52. Voltage across the capacitor, VC is equal to, use the same basic thing, except now I put the minus J250 times seven in the numerator 
and I use the same denominator, 120 at angle 36.86. Minus J250, and that comes up to 8.65 at angle, minus 28.34. Any questions so far? This will be posted, like, tonight, so you can look at it again if you want to. Number eight, the last one. Okay, uh, 30 and 500. And this is kind of a mess, 2.2K and J, 2K, and then uh, here is 1.5K, and then a minus J, 1K. So how do you thevenize this? Well, you thevenize it from this point back, looking back at it from that point right there, okay? so. You have to find these two first, and that is 1479.88 at angle 47.72. So now I've got that. So I use voltage divider to find Thevenin, V Thevenin. Use voltage divider, it's 30 times 1479.88 at angle 47.72 over 500 plus 1479.88 at angle 47.72. And that's equal to 23.95 at angle 11.51. It's all math. This is straight old math. What is R thevenin? Now you have to go back and you have to short out the voltage supply. These two are dangling, but they have to be added in. So basically R thevenin is equal to the 1.5 K minus J1K plus the 500 in parallel with the 1479.88 at angle 47.72. And that's equal to, you can do that all in one step with that calculator, by the way. This all can be brought to bear with one step. That's the beauty of that calculator, minus 25.94 degrees. Any question? Any comment? Too hard, too easy? Not easy. Where are we going with this? Well, I'm giving you half of your points back if you hand back to me a worked out copy. So if you, let's say you got 50, okay? So a score of 50. If you work out the problems that you missed, hand them back to me. I'll give you a 75. Okay, that's the deal. I think that helps everybody. It puts you all back to a little bit better score. And it also cements the idea that, you know, these are problems that you probably could get. But on the other hand, not everybody's going to get them. And I feel like maybe I didn't do as good a job or whatever at points in time. I don't know. But we got to keep going. We're not going to go back and we're, gonna, we're not going to review these again. Um, we will have maybe a little bit of this in the second test, but not a lot. There will still be the J stuff, but it won't be as quite as extensive, and we're going to do some other stuff. So basically, we're moving on. Hopefully, you, if you don't like this stuff, we're going to be having some other stuff that might be a little bit more interesting to you. Hopefully, that will be the case. Okay. I've had tests that I've come back with that, that have had bad scores on them, and I sympathize with you. So you probably think, no, he's a teacher. He had to always get perfect scores. I didn't. So I sympathize. But, you know, I learned. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I stood there and got a diploma like the rest of them. So um, hang in there. Don't give up. Okay, I want to go back and I want to do this video. If we got time, if we don't have time, uh, we, we should be able to do most of this. So I think it's about an hour long. It's, it's a fairly hefty video, but it is, I think, once you see it, you'll probably say, why didn't you show us this, scare me to death, and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, um, I, I think it's in this course, one I think it's in.
Yeah, this is it. This is filmed here, by the way. This is this is a local production. Um, my background is I used to be an electrician many years ago. I worked at GDM now. Um, I am certified by NFPA 50 volts. The minute that you work on 50 volts and above, you're in a federal standard under law. This is where your your um, employer has to decide to be careful because everybody in this room has a one in 300 chance of going home. The minute you start working on electricity, you have a one in 10 chance. It is 30 times more dangerous to work on electricity than any other field in the country because of the nature of, of the beast. Because of that, there are federal regulations that says once you cross that bound of 50 volts, below 50 volts they believe that you, you will not be killed by the voltage. At 50 volts and above they believe you will. So I'm going to show you a couple different uh, uh, instances that you've got to realize how this works. And realize if you're going to go in the industry and you're going to be working on electricity, be careful because um, you may be here. And you better make sure you know what to ask people. For example, when you're working on electricity, you should be wearing certain types of gloves. And we'll kind of get into that as far as the shock thing. But this is kind of spooky for companies to realize that uh, it, is, it is 30 times more dangerous because it is a very skillful trade. Uh, the electrical industry goes, I'm talking about power-wise, goes from this to a nuclear station with everything in between. There is no one that knows everything. So that's where people start specializing. But the minute that you go over that 50 volts, it doesn't matter whether you're working at 50 volts or 5,000 volts. You're in a federal standard. Okay, shock. Everybody ever felt a pump in their life? Right? Everybody's felt one, right? Okay. Let me explain to you how close you came from being dead. And I'm going to explain. Um, a shock is something, an electric current going through your body. I think you can probably figure that out. All of you in here have had Ohm's Law, correct? I'm assuming sometime or another. Well, I'm going to show you how Ohm's Law, how it relates to safety, not talking about resistors now. We're talking about the Ohm's Law related to shock. Electrocution is the fourth leading cause of industrial fatalities in the country. It is very, very dangerous. This is the one that kills a lot of people. Now, it takes 75 one thousandths of one amp 75 milliamps, you know what milliamps are, correct? 75 milliamps, and you're dead. The outlet that's on this wall has a 20 amp breaker somewhere in the panel supplying the wall outlet. So that's 20,000 milliamps. 75 one thousandths, and you're done. So it does not, don't underestimate electricity. 110 kills more people than all of the voltages combined. There's more of it. So if you think you're only working on 110 and I'm not working on 480 or higher voltages, don't, don't kid yourself. 
Here's what happened. I want to explain how this works. When you fell a pope, you had one to ten one thousandths of one amp passing through your body. Now I'm going to give you an example. If this, if this right here was something like an energized piece of equipment, and I have to walk up and touch it, it could be an outlet, it could be a plug, it could be anything. Here's what's happening. So I, I would draw it up here, but it might be a little hard to see. I think I can describe it. This outlet right here has 20 amps that's coming from a panel that's down the hallway. Okay? There's a, there's a power panel somewhere. What happens when I touch this, 20 amps comes through the power system and it goes into my body. It goes into my hand. It goes through my body and it goes through my feet. The internal resistance of my body is based on a lot of factors. But that resistance starts knocking down the current on the wall. Okay? Now what it does is it goes through my socks, it goes through my rubber shoes. These are not voltage graded shoes, so the current is going to go through them. It's going to go through that carpet, it's going to hit the concrete, it's going to run down the hallway on the concrete. Concrete is not non-conductive. It is eventually going to find the panel that's serving this room. It's going to go in the ground wire, it's going to run down that ground wire, and it's going to go all the way back to the transformer that's feeding this building. That's a circuit. You know about circuits. When you add up the resistance between my finger and that ground rod that's somewhere in the site, you add up all that resistance, that's current. So what happens is not much current's going to flow through my body. So when you felt a poke, you felt one to ten one thousandths of an amp actually passing through your body. All of the rest of it was taken up by the resistance. Now, if I would have touched this, and I would be standing outside, I'd be dead. Because I would not have the carpet, the mat, the concrete. I, the closer I get to that ground rod, the worse this is going to get. So understand that when you get up to one-tenth of an amp and start shoving down your heart, you get up to one and a half amps and it starts burning the inside of your body like a, like a hot dog. So don't underestimate current. Again. It's how you're grounded. I can, I can hang on the high voltage wires out here in my bare hands, because those wires are not insulated, and it won't hurt me. It's just like a squirrel, because I'm not grounded. The minute that squirrel touches that wire and his back feet touches the pole, there is no more squirrel, because there's a path directly to the ground, and that path the current, if the squirrel is in it, the squirrel is dead. So the key you gotta remember is how are you gonna be grounded, and how do you prevent being grounded? All of this stuff happens. Voluntary falls, heat damage, fibrillation of your heart, exit wounds, uh, brain malfunction, muscular contractions. Um, it happens immediately. It happens after a while or it's long term. This damage right here can, can show up years later. So if people get electrocuted, they should go and be tested because this is a problem. Here's your Ohm's law. So this should give you something you understand. Well, now you're understanding this has something to do with something other than resistors and printed circuit boards. It has to do with people's lives. It really kind of depends. Your dry skin is not very conductive. That's 100,000 ohms because my hands are dry. The minute that your hands get wet, you drop to 1,000 ohms. Inside your body, you are 70% water. Therefore, you're going to conduct electricity real well on the inside of your body. In your head, and you'll probably agree with this, you're basically mush. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you're only at 100 ohms inside your head. So again, the pro there is actually laws that will say you cannot take an extension cord and plug it into another extension cord if your hands are wet. Because the minute you do that, it can track. Do you understand that water will not conduct electricity? I know that. You will? I won't. Come on. Why not? Pure water. Pure water won't. Demineralized water, the only thing that makes current go through water is the minerals. So when you see a high voltage substation, do you know how they clean it? Think of something really stupid. How do they clean it when it's live? A water can. And they just let it happen. And it will all come down because it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to conduct anything. Okay, so here's what we were talking about. How are you connected to the ground? 
You can be connected to the source. It can go through your body and through different paths. It can go out your hand. So if I touch this, and I touch something that's grounded, it goes right through my body. This is why it's so dangerous at home to be working on something and touch a sink. A sink is connected to the water, which is connected to the ground. It's a direct connection. That's why there's ground fault there. You can be connected to the ground by way of your feet. You can step on electricity, and you can actually step on a grounding source. When I was in a burn center, it blew a guy's feet off. It can go in your hand, and it can go out your foot. It's got to, it, if, if it can't get out of you, it can't hurt you. You can stand on a high-voltage mat, and you can grab right a hold of it with your hand, and it won't hurt you. As long as it can't get through my feet, as no other part of my body is touching the earth, I can't be hurt. But you, that's the key. Are you sure that there's no connection to ground? Because it'll find it really, really fast. So electrically, what that has to happen in the industry is you have to wear gloves. OSHA, I train the OSHA offices in Toledo. You are mandatory, you must wear voltage rated gloves to prevent the electricity from getting in your hands. If it can't get in your hands, it can't get in your feet because it can't get in your body. Okay? That's what happens when it comes out. It makes a hole. If it comes out, it blows a hole in your skin because it's traveling inside your body. Now this guy right here, this isn't a grocery out. Hopefully this will run. And I gotta make sure this is on. But I want to make a point here. What I want you to realize is he's going to touch that wire and down down the stream here, down way, maybe a mile away, there's a transformer. That transformer has a grounded connection that goes down to the earth. So what he's gonna do is the current's gonna come on that wire, down his body, down that metal car, to the rail, down the rail to the wood, into the wood, into the dirt, across the dirt to the ground rod. That's the connection. Now that connection can be a mile away, it doesn't matter. But when he touches it, there's gonna be a problem. Because you think you're invincible. You can date four women at the same time, you can drive like a bad man, and I don't know what you're doing with electricity, but this is crazy. Now when you get older, back here, how old is the professor? Right there, yes. I'm here? 60, 66. Okay, he either doesn't do anything, <laughs> or he tells him to do it, but by this time he's smart enough not to be killed by it. Okay, so. Statistically, I don't know why, but watch your age. It doesn't matter how big you are. Some people say, I've seen big guys go up so I can take that, and they do something really stupid. That right there, he bit that thinking that was dinner. Mm -hmm. Now, I gotta ask, who's the star student here? Oh, it must be you. <laughs> He's got a pink shirt on, so I gotta ask him. What does this teach you about electricity? You get extra credit if you can answer. Anybody want to help him? I mean, he's, he obviously is the best student. <laughs> you never work barefoot. <laughs> when he bit that, the current went in his leg, doesn't have shoes on, directed to the ground, it traveled through the ground until it found the grounded connection of where that transformer is. I don't know where it's at, but it found it. It went through the dirt and it. And when it did that, the current went through his body. Now, this isn't to gross you out, this is to make a point. Look at this. Electrocution, 80% of the fatalities are burn related on the inside of your body. You think of someone being electrocuted and the, I don't know, the brain goes dead or something like that, their heart stops. 
here's what's actually happening. The current will go into your skin. It'll travel on the nerves and tendons in your body. It'll travel until it can find where the connection is to ground. So it's using your, your, it's using your body now as a conductor. Your body is not meant to have current going through it. It's now what happens is a few days later, the tissue starts to die. Now, if this happens to run through your heart, your liver, your kidney, or any other part of your body, that's what the inside of your body is going to look like because you're being cooked from the inside. Now, remember, this happens in a fraction of a second. It doesn't have, you don't have to hold on for an hour. It happens very, very quickly. Isn't that fun? The other thing that electrocution can cause is falls. The first thing that a person does when they get shot is they, they pull back. They, they could be on a ladder, they could fall. It, falls actually have killed as many people as the electrician because people actually fall. And the electrician, uh, electrical doesn't hurt them, it's the fall that kills them. So be careful. Anybody know what art flash is? The actual phenomena of it. Now, don't feel bad because when I do this class in front of electricians, or even engineers, electrical engineers that have graduated in electrical engineering have no idea what this is, unless they happen to be a power engineer. Now, now we're going back into a specialty now. You've graduated from the university, you're going by the way of power. It's a whole different animal when you're talking about power. So I'm going to explain to you what art flash is. Art flash is a phenomenon that got me burnt. I was four feet away from it. It blew my eardrum out. It blew every light out in the building. I was in a basement. I'm either dead blind or blew every light out because I can't see. I had gloves on. I wasn't even doing the work. I had little leather gloves on. They burnt the gloves to a crisp, but my hands never got burned. Then I went to the burn center. Then they give you morphine. Then you throw up, and then away you go. They give you a putty knife, and they tell you to get the skin off. Now, what arc flash is, is this is the thermal part of an arc flash. The blast is the pressure part of the flash. So think of a firecracker. You throw a firecracker on the ground, you can see it. That's the flash. You might even feel the heat. That's the, that's the blast part, excuse me, the arc flash part. The part that you hear and the part that you feel, if it's a big enough firecracker, is the blast part. Both of these can be fatal. Both of them can kill you. There is clothing to protect you against this. There's nothing to stop that. So I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you what an art flash is going to look like, and then I'm going to explain what it is. And let's see what happens here. Okay, this is what an art flash looks like if you are not wearing protective clothing. Here's what it's going to do. This man again is wearing polyester cotton shirt and pants, targeting category two here. A large arc and an immediate fire, and notice that the back of the garment is on fire immediately, even though the arc never hit him in the back. Stop, drop, and roll is not going to put this out. This fire is too aggressive for that. The pants are on fire as well. It's hard to see right now, but when our firefighter moves the mannequin, you can clearly see that the pants are ignited as well, and the shirt within seconds is almost completely burned. Now, I want you to look at, you're going to see this in slow motion, but I want you to look at something. And the shirt within seconds is almost... Look at this panel. That is now plated with copper. That can go into your lungs. Now, I'm going to start this and I'm going to ask you some questions. And he can't answer because he might know the answer because of his background. Completely burned answer. off the mat. Here you have a split screen, slow motion. Okay, so what starts this? A what? Short. A short. Correct. A short means what? What to what to what to what to what to what? To what? Can you make that up? There are three phases. If one of the phases touch another phase, or if one of the phases touch the ground. Now, if you have a phase going to ground and it's, it's positively connected, that's called a bolted fault. You won't see this. It's when there is not a bolted fault, it's called an arcing fault, which means now the current tries to go through the air. When it goes through the air, it starts ionizing the air, and it causes a plasma. So you're seeing a plasma that's being created by a short. I want you to change the word short and try to get used to the word fault. Short, fault, potato, potato. But get used to it. Now watch what happens. As this fault begins. The view at 3,000 frames a second, you get a terrific look at the arc. Comes out, hits the mannequin, and bounces to his right and left and down, but never gets his back. Now, if you don't have protective clothing on, first of all, Ocean will be rather upset with your employer because you have to. 
if you open that panel, you have to have a certain level of protection against that heat because you won't be around otherwise. And in a moment here, as the arc starts to subside, you'll see the garment on fire as the smoke clears okay. and starts to rise. What, what turns a short off? The disconnect. Kind of. Give me another word. What turns a short off? What turns a short off in your house? A breaker. A breaker, use the word overcurrent device. It can be a fuse, it can be a circuit breaker, it can be a relay, it can be different things that let current through it. When the current is going through upstream from this, there is an overcurrent device. The overcurrent device <coughs> shuts this power down during the time that it's thinking about it, this is occurring. So eventually this is going to go away. An outstanding look as pieces of burning and melting polyester cotton are being thrown away from the mannequin on fire and the smoke's lifting from his knees on up and you can clearly see the garment on fire. This sort of an incident is going to result in catastrophic or fatal body burn. These catastrophic and fatal injuries can be prevented by wearing the appropriate PPE, including flame-resistant fabrics. Okay, so now we're going to say, here's what OSHA says that every employer has to do. This is what JDRM does. We do engineering studies to figure this out. We know what the energy is that's going to come out of that box. We now tell people wear a certain level of clothing that's going to go up against that heat. That heat is in calories, so you're going to see how this clothing really will work. It's amazing. This mannequin is wearing West Tech's ultra soft pants and lightweight knit shirt. You have our arc. You can see a huge amount of old metal, even in real time, all over the floor and thrown an enormous distance from the disconnect. Some of that old metal ended up in excess of 40 feet away. But again, no fire on the garments. No break open. All right, here we have a split screen slow-mo, 3,000 frames a second. The arc at first is a torso event. You can see a huge amount of molten metal being thrown a huge distance from the arc gap over his left shoulder. Meanwhile, the arc has hit the mannequin, traveled down the body, and becomes the... You have to have a face shield on. The face shield is thermally rated. The face shield is amber to protect your eyes. You have to have a sock underneath that. You have to have your hands covered. Any part of your body that's exposed will get burned. Any part of it. Now, this is, this is exactly what they do at a steel mill except there are three carbon electrodes that are 18 feet, 18 inches across and 30 foot tall. They bring them down into a big pot of ground up steel and they short it out deliberately. And it starts melting and it melts anything that's there. It's 36,000 degrees. It's going to melt the steel and eventually they pull a chute and there's your liquid steel. So this is what a steel mill looks like. They've said this is not a steel mill, this is a person now. It's primarily a lower body event. That's copper and steel and flying. The amount of old metal now is being thrown up in the air. It's going to land 20, 30, 40. Feet. What you don't want to do is approach anybody when those panels are open. Because if you don't have the protective clothing on, you're going to get it. Feet from the disconnect. Look also at the floor on the left-hand portion of your screen, the pulled-back portion. Look at the amount of molten metal. It's literally painted almost the entire floor is orange with molten copper, and yet the arc's still going on, and there's an equal or greater amount of molten copper still in the air. This is a huge amount of molten metal. And again, this molten copper is a minimum of 1,900 Fahrenheit, more than twice as much energy as is necessary to ignite non-FR copper. Now, you remember that little triangle? This is all part of it. Shock is all part of it. You do not have these hazards if you're a carpenter. You've got other hazards, not this one. Now I'm going to show you a larger these faults get larger and larger. This is going to be a larger one, then I'll explain it in a minute. This mannequin is wearing West Tech's ultra soft 40 carry flash suit and he's up on the ladder. Because the ladder is this high what happens when electricians up the ladder. So we're faulting the upper bucket of the motor control center. It's a 45.7 calorie arc. It's a very large arc. There's a ton of molten metal coming out in all directions, but there is no fire on the garment. You'll see when our firefighters come in and turn the mannequin around that there's also no break open, showing that even in a 45 calorie arc, the ultra soft provides sufficient protection. We get a look at our split screen slow motion, and at 3,000 frames a second, this is a 14 cycle arc. You get a great look at the pulsing and pulsing of these cycles, and you see that the molten metal comes out as a wall. This is unusual. You can now see pressure. It's all the way around this. That is the, the part that you hear. That happens to be the pressure wave ultrasonically. It's, it's moving in front of that, that light wave and it is, it's strong enough to break bones in a person's body. That's the part that can blow you off the ladder. That's the part you hear. So 
So this was going to go on for a while until something turns it off. The previous clothing would not, would not withstand this. This clothing is much thicker. So this isn't a good place to be, but... Oh, there's a wall of molten metal going in all directions. And the arc eventually defeats the sides of the MCC as well, and we get the arc plasma out to the right and left of the mannequin. You better stick with the PLC, right? Okay. If you're trained and you're dressed and you know what you're doing, you probably are not going to have an issue, but it can always happen. Okay, these are the three most important slides to explain this. And you will understand this better than most electrical engineers that have not studied power. I'm going to use water to explain this. So it will be a very good representation. This lake right here is an enormous volume of water. We're, we're going to call this your transformer. This is the transformer for the building. In that transformer is 50,000 amps, depending on the size of the transformer. That's called short circuit current or fault current. It's in the transformer. It's there, but it's not in the building. So here's this big reservoir of energy, or water. This, this dam right here is the main service for a building. So this service might be a 2,000 amp panel board that's inviting 2,000 into the building to do work. So 50,000 here, 2,000 is being in the building. That splash right there is one circuit breaker in that panel that might be a 400 amp circuit breaker or fuse. It goes down the wire, so you know what impedance is, correct? Impedance is going to start knocking down the fault current. Think of it as resistance, impedance. So the longer this is and the smaller the wire, it's going to start changing the amount of energy that's going to move down the wire. So that water is, is a wire. That 400 amps is going to go to a sub-panel. This is the sub-panel. That is one breaker inside of the sub-panel now, that gate. So we're going to call that 100 amps. It's going to go down a wire, and it's going to go to a panel where somebody is working, and we're going to call it the bridge. Okay? So right now, the only hazard that there is is electrocution. If you touch something right there, you're going to be electrocuted. There is no arc flash because there's no fault. The fault has to occur here. Either a person creates it or equipment creates it. Something has to create it. Now, here's the spooky part. There's the reservoir, which is the transformer. There's the sub-panel. The instant that this fault occurs here, at the speed of electricity, anybody know that speed? Really fast. Put that on the test. Um, this 50,000 amps automatically comes in the building because it thinks that you need more electricity, more load. So it'll go right past this service and will not trip it. It'll run down this wire, 50,000 amps. As it goes down the wire, think of it like running down a tube. The longer it goes, the less water is going to get there. The more impedance there is on the wire, the less it's going to get further down the line. So now there's 35,000 amps here. If that device right there is a circuit breaker or a fuse that's rated to clear 35,000 amps and it does it very quickly, then this person may not even see an arc flash. They may see a little teeny spark because that shut the energy off before it got to them. The problem is, if this takes one-tenth of one second to open the circuit, it's going to allow 30,000 amps past it, right to there. Now the arc flash is going to occur. You're in it. Now, I don't think a tenth of a second is a long time, but it is an eternity in an arc flash. The arc flash is going to begin, and then it will eventually get shut off when that turns it off. But the problem is, it's going to be right there. The transformer is going to get you. So what I try to tell electricians, when you open anything up that's three-phase, that transformer is staring at you on the other end of that wire. It doesn't matter where you are, but it, it is looking at you, and it will come if there's a fault. So this is the big danger about this. You don't know what this is. You don't know the length of this wire. You don't know how fast this is going to react. So I'm going to show you a little bit about this. This guy right here is putting a large breaker into a panel. What's going to happen is this breaker is going to fit. There's going to be a short. He's cranking a handle. The breaker is slowly going in. It's going to touch the live bus. 
if there was nothing wrong with the breaker, there wouldn't be a problem. There is a short in the breaker. So somewhere outside the building, the transformer is going to deliver fault current. And it's going to come out of the box. It's, it's not going to be a mannequin now. It's going to be a person. So now, he doesn't get to go home. So they call his wife up and tell him, we got to talk. Wrong safety equipment. Should not be doing it live. He should have checked the breaker. Something's wrong with the breaker. But when it touches, it's going to go off. So he sees a bright white light like I did, except he never comes out of it. Now, this is an interesting software that I'm going to make some points with to you. Now, whereas before I showed you a video, now I can control everything with this, this software. Here's voltage. I'm going to put it at 480 volts. It doesn't matter. Here's fault current. You now know what that is. That's the transformer. I'm going to put it way down to 3,000 amps. The clearing time of the upstream device is going to operate in 0.01 seconds. I'm going to move you in front of the panel. I'm going to put you about 18 inches away from the panel. And I'm going to create an arc flash. Now, the reason why the guy didn't get hurt is, number one, there wasn't much energy, and it wasn't there for long. It was very, very fast. Now, the problem is this. In reality, this is not what's going to be there. There's going to be something greater. And there might be some circuit breaker or fuse that doesn't react as quickly. So now what I'm going to do is go over here. And now what's going to happen, I'll slow it down. The energy is going to come out of the box. When the energy comes out of the box, it ignites a person's clothing. And then the circuit breaker, yeah, he moans because he's kind of sick. That's what happens when you've been in class too long. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to take you and we're going to put you over here. And we're going to put clothing on you. Now you have a specialized set of clothing. So now, the clothing goes up against the heat. It doesn't go up against a particle. If anything is solid, it's 750 miles an hour, you're standing in front of a cannon. It's going to go directly through the person. It's only protecting against heat. Okay, so now we'll put it back over here. Well, the laser look at this. This is kind of weird. Watch this. Now you're looking through the glasses of the guy. You've got right to see. That's what the glasses look like. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull you back to here and make a point. Right now, this guy is not being hurt. I'm going to put him right here. The problem is, now think about this. A shotgun with bird shot in at the 50-yard line and you're at the goal line, you're going to feel it, but it's not going to kill you. The closer you get, now I'm not going to change any of these factors. I'm just going to move you closer. So now you're closer. So it's like walking towards a shotgun. The closer you get, the worse the energy is. You half the distance, you double the energy. So you don't want to be any closer than you have to be. All right, now I'll make some other points here. I'm going to pull this guy back. He's got a long life. Okay. I'm going to turn this energy up. And I'm going to, now you know what this is. That's fault current. That's from the transformer. That's how long the over upstream device is going to take to trip. I'm going to put heavier clothing on the guy. Now, this, let's say this is you, and you want to get rid of Ted. So we got to get rid of Ted. <laughs> let's get rid of him. Because you know how they look over your shoulder? Got you. Sorry, boss. <laughs> You're not supposed to approach people when the panel's open. First of all, he can't see. So we're, we're going to be off him, so he's gone. <laughs> Now, this clothing is going to withstand it. I'm going to take it all the way up to 60,000 amps for two seconds. <coughs> the clothing will, will take up to 40 calories of energy, which we'll see in a minute, and then the clothing is going to fail too. There is no, there is no permanent solution to the clothing. Now, now, I'm going to take this guy moving back just a little bit, and I'm going to have no PPE on. 60,000 amps. Anybody want to tell me what's going to happen to this guy with no PPE? Disintegrate, right? Here we go.
Nothing. Why? Huh? That's great. I turned the time down. Now, what I want you to think about is this. If you have your shirt off, and it's 12 o'clock noon in August, and you walk outside, that's energy. And if you walk outside, walk right back in the room, that's time. Energy and time. I don't get a sunburn if I walk back in the room. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this down to 30,000 amps, half the energy, but I'm going to raise the time. So now you're going to go out at 1 o'clock. So I'm starting to go down, but I'm going to be out for an hour and a half. Time's going up. Now watch what happens. Less energy, more time. You're in trouble. Take it to an extreme now. I'm going to turn the energy down to one quarter of what the energy was originally, and I'm going to turn the time up. So now you're out there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm going down, but you're going to be out for three hours. Now the time goes up. So now, what I'm trying to make a point with this is that what's going on is energy and time. Now, the only thing you guys know about energy and time right now, probably, is you ever use timing circuits? Right? That's time. Energy would be probably, I don't, you're really not dealing with energy like this. Okay? But, it, but you can see what I'm getting at. Energy and time are the big factors here. Now, Here's what's happening when you see that arc flash. It's 35,000 degrees. It's four times hotter than the surface of the sun because it's arcing through the air. The only thing hotter than this is Davis Vesey, is a nuclear reaction on the Earth. The molten metal is what catches the clothing on fire. The arc flash crystallized my skin, which was bad. I did not have, I had a short sleeve shirt on, and right there is where the short sleeve shirt stopped. Luckily, I did not have a heavy shirt on. I was far enough away. It crystallized the shirt and it fell off. If it would have been a heavy shirt, it would have ignited. It would have caught fire. There would have been enough fuel for it to catch fire. It did not. That molten metal bounced off here and it burnt my skin. The atomic bomb on the drop into Hiroshima was 12,000 degrees on the ground. It's three times hotter than the bomb when it goes off. Shrapnel. Nothing can stop it. There is no clothing except there. Intense light will blind you. If you do not have a face shield on with this amber color on there, it will wreck your retinas. The pressure, you saw pressure. A large arc flash can take a 160 pound person and accelerate them by pressure from zero to 110 miles an hour in 51 thousandths of one second. That's getting hit really hard, really fast. Copper will expand 67,000 times its volume, and that turns into vapor, and it goes in your lungs. Now, you remember that little triangle over here? That's what electricians, this is what electricians work on every single day. Now, it may, it may get them, it may never get them, but the point is, it is there. The fact of the matter is it's there. This is what fault current looks like coming in a building. Watch how the transformer reacts to this. The wires aren't even going to like it. The sparks were flying in southeast Portland today. The fault is in the building. The transformer is delivering That's fault a transformer blowing. Eventually, it's going to blow up the transformer or blow up the fuses. The fire crew is trying to keep onlookers up wind and the smoke because electrical fires the wires are going to start melting. The fire was limited to the electrical equipment and the transformers. The building itself did not burn. Damage estimated at $100,000. Now, here's the substation. You got one right over here, right? If that substation has a fault, where does it get its fault current? Davis Bessie. From the grid. The grid goes back to Davis Bessie. Davis Bessie is going to give fault current to the substation. It's going to start melting the entire substation. It'll melt anything that's in there. Any steel, anything. Right down to the concrete. Transformer and it blew up. Now the wires are still hot, but not, the wires are not touching anything. There's no fault because the fault now has been cleared. Because it's not touching. The wire's not touching, it's not touching the ground. This guy right here 
is throwing a cable over top of a log truck. He's going to lash down to the cables or the, the logs. He snags that line right there. So what do you think comes down? Fault current. Fault current is going to go down here. It's going to go right down that line. Now, if you're at home and the, the lights go on and off three times, you know why that is? There's a branch probably touching that. That's why they trim the trees. And what it is, it's a reclosure or an electronic breaker turning it back on three times. It's trying to blow the branch up. And if the branch blows up because the fault current would go here, down the branch, down the tree, to the roots of the tree, all the way back to the ground. And it would blow the branch up. After the third try, it stops because it's something other than the tree. In this case, it, it can't blow this up. It fault current melts the truck. So then you got to call your boss and say, I'm going to be late getting back. <laughs> it's very serious. OSHA's liability, lawsuits, all of this. Very, very serious. This guy is putting a breaker in without a face shield on. You will not have a face. You will not have eyes. You have got to wear glasses. There's a person looking over his shoulder, watching him do the work. He's going to get it too. He should be there. Okay, again, burns can go up to Fourth degree burns actually burn inside your body. It burns muscles and tendons. I have second degree burns. That's painful because you still have nerves. Once you go above the second degree, you don't have any nerves. This is what the skin looks like. Then they give you a putty knife and tell you to scrape it off. And if you blow on it, it hurts. But you got to get it off and you'll have gangrene. When you hear about percentage of burn that's occurred, that number goes higher. That means there's holes in your body. That means you die from infection. That's what kills people, is infection. Getting in there. It doesn't matter how clean the hospital is. The infection. The greater the area, the more likely you're to, to die. A calorie is what this energy is all about. If you take your finger and put it there, you're going to have 1.2 calories on the tip of your finger. Not centigrade or Fahrenheit, calories. This is the way energy will be known. In energy, not voltage. Heat, 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 heat. The higher this heat goes up, the worse it's going to get. If you go above this much heat, there's nothing can stop it. That they know it. Here's a real low level. It's just a long sleeve shirt and pants. Here's the next level. The clothing's getting thicker. Now the clothing's got to get thicker. Now it's going to get thicker. Now it's going to get so thick that you have to have an air pack in there to blow air into the suit. But that's, that's going to resist 40 calories of heat can be caused by fault current, duration, all of these things are what cause it. A breaker, you know, when you, you know about breakers, right? Briefly, I'm gonna tell you this, all of these things you don't know about a breaker, so make sure I got until what time, so I know. Quarter till two. Okay, got another half hour. Good. Okay, here we go. The first thing is, you better be careful opening things under load. If you open something under load, it has to be rated to open under load. Otherwise, it's going to explode. Now, how do things open under load safely? Very fast. Speed. Next thing, I'm going to show you what time current curves mean. You have no idea what these mean, but they, they control time. Torque value. You've got to be able to torque the wires down so it's on the breaker. Short circuit rating. Now, here's the beginning of your understanding about what short circuit rating is. If this is a breaker, and downstream is, is where this is feeding. That's where the arc flash is going to be. Now, you know fault current's going to come in the building, right? The fault current's going to go through this breaker. This breaker has to have a amp interrupting capacity that is equal to the fault current that's going to go through it. If this is not rated, it'll explode. So you can buy this breaker that's rated for 5,000, 15,000, 30,000, 40,000, 60,000. Guess what? As that number goes up, so does the cost. So what do people go out and do? They buy the cheap one. If they don't know what they're doing, and they put this in, in the circuit, and this breaker tries to clear the fault, it will explode. It's not rated to clear the fault. Frame size is, this is a 100 amp breaker, but it's a 150 amp frame. It can be up to 150 amps. Instantaneous trip. On the breaker, you guys know it is low. This is a 100 amp breaker. 
This says 1300 amps on it. What's 1300 amps? That's called inrush. That means that that breaker will allow 1300 amps to go through it for a very short amount of time to help start a motor. Because the motor is going to leave a little bit more current. And after a short amount of time, it's going to trip. That's called inrush down. Okay? You are not allowed to reset a breaker or change your fuse. It is illegal. Did you know that? That's OSHA. Manual closing of breakers and, and certain fuses are prohibited. Why? You have to know whether it was an overload, which means you got two toaster ovens in, or it was a fault. An overload is altogether different than a fault. An overload means you got too much on the circuit. Take something off. A fault is a whole other ball game. A breaker is now clearing tens of thousands of amps, not 30 amps. So you have to know the difference between these two things or you're not allowed to touch a breaker or a fuse. You have these at home, correct? A circuit breaker will kill you before you trip. You'll be dead long dead before that trips. 75 milliamps. That breaker is going to trip at about 25 amps. So you're long dead. This right here is the GFCI. This will trip in 1 40th of one second. Now here's what it's doing. It's looking at the ratio between the hot and neutral wire. If some of that current and that ratio starts going through my body, going to ground, there's a, there's a pickup in here that will pick it up. It'll automatically trip that out saying, I don't know where that current's going, but it ain't going through the wire where it's supposed to. Therefore, I'm going to shut it down. So these will protect people. But you have these at home, correct? When's the last time you hit that button right there? If you don't hit that test button, you have no idea that it's going to work. So you make sure that you test this stuff at home. Because guess where you're going to find them? In your sinks, your bathrooms, outdoors, wherever there's a good ground connection is where these things are going to reside. Because if you get grounded, you got nothing to protect you. don't have carpeting and stuff to protect you. You'll be dead. Grounding requirements. OSHA has all kinds of grounding requirements. Really, really difficult. Why are grounds so important? Now, I don't know. Electronically, why are grounds so important? The cases or the metallic cases and things like that get energized, it'll um, take away the charge from it. From? From the case, so that when you touch it, you don't get shocked. Okay, people. Yeah. Okay, so what he just said was this. He just said <coughs> that if that case becomes hot, you want to have this to be a low impedance path to ground, and you want to be a much higher impedance path. That means that the current won't go through you. So if that's not grounded and you become the ground, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. Now, ground rods, remember I told you where fault current, where does fault current eventually get back to? The ground rod. That ground rod is that's the transformer. It eventually has to go completely through a circuit and go back to that ground rod. And then what it does is it dissipates in the ground like this. Okay? You can be killed from the ground. It's called step potential, earth potential rise. If that fault current from a building happens to go in that ground rod and you happen to be standing here, if you're standing next to that tower and your one foot is there and your one foot is there, the lightning is going to hit that tower. Uh-oh, i got to plug something in. Um, it's going to go through your foot. Okay. really spooky. You don't think about being killed from the ground, correct? The ground will kill you. So you gotta be careful. Where where should you be more concerned? Tomorrow tonight or tomorrow morning? If this could happen to you. Lightning? You never stand under a tree. It isn't the tree branch that's gonna kill you. Here's what's gonna happen. This is the tree. The lightning is going to go in the ground. It's going to put a potential across the ground. If you are standing within 60 feet of that tree, it's going to kill you from the ground up. If you ever see on the news where people are being killed by lightning, lightning didn't hit them. The ground killed them. If you go on YouTube, put in soccer lightning, and 
you will see lightning that's going to hit a hit a soccer field, and five people are going to fall over. It looks like puppets falling over because it hit the ground. It's going to go 60 feet away. Once it goes down the tree, it goes in the roots. Once it goes in the roots, it starts crossing through the ground until it dissipates. There is a higher and lower potential between your feet, you're dead. So if you see a cow laying out in the middle of a field, he didn't have a heart attack. The lightning hit the ground and it killed the cow from the ground up. So complicated, electricity is complicated, right? Wonderful. Turn it off. This is, this is what happens when you turn electricity off. It gets pissed. <laughs> okay, so. That's meant to do that, but that happens in a breaker when you turn a breaker off on a very, very small scale. That's why you have to know stuff's load break rated because electricity is going to go through the air trying to maintain itself. And in that case, obviously, that's extremely high transmission voltage and it's going to create a big arc. This is load break rated. They use oil to suppress arcs. That ain't. If you open that under load, you're going to draw an arc right here. And if you draw an arc there and it goes over and touches the other arc, boom, you just woke the transformer up. There's transformers. There's a thing called corona, and it's not a beer. <laughs> There's an area around the wire that is an ionized gas. <coughs> if you touch that gas, you don't have to touch the wire. If you touch the gas, it'll kill you. So you have to understand if you're around high voltage, that it is very dangerous being around it. Circuit breakers and fuses. You don't understand these. You know them right now for whatever you're using for, for three amps or whatever, right? But what you really don't understand what they do is they control time. You think of them as low, right? One amp, two amps, three amps. Here's what electricians don't understand, and you will now understand. First of all, you're not allowed to modify overcurrent devices so you don't do stuff like this. Now they were so lazy, they didn't even have the same size nipple three times. You're not supposed to do that. Now, here's what time means. This is a sine wave. There, this is one tenth of a second, 10 seconds. If an arc flash occurs at zero, zero time, then what's gonna happen is, if this is 30,000 amps, and you're standing over here, you're standing in front of it, you're gonna be exposed to 30,000 amps for a tenth of a second. That's a long time. You want to be, you want the arc flash to be over and one half of one cycle of one second. That's called a current limiting RK5 fuse. Or one quarter of one half of one cycle of one second. That's eight one thousandths of a second. Now the 30,000 amps that was here that would have burnt the hell out of you is not going to hurt you. Why? Why is it going to hurt you? Right, the energy Remember you walk outside and walk back in again? That's what that is. The energy is the same, but the time is really short. So now it's not going to hurt you. So now you've got to control time. So here's an example of a test chamber and how we know all this stuff. They put a trigger wire in there, which is a dead short. These right here are called calorimeters. They're measuring heat as it comes out of the box. So I'm going to show you <clears throat> how, how fuses can do different things that you're not aware of, neither are, neither are electricians. So I'm gonna go like this. This is 30,000 amps coming into this box. There is an RK1 current limiting fuse, which is called a Busman KTSR fuse. Forget it's a 200 amp. Watch what it does to the fault current. The fault current, when that short is there, here comes the fault current from the transformer. Comes in there, and by the time it gets there, the upstream device trips so quickly that it barely even gets to your chest. So this is a 200 amp busting fuse. This is a 200 amp busting fuse. Okay, these are two different, these look the same because they're both 200 amp and they're both busting. Where the problem is, is this. Even electricians don't know this. Fuse have time current curves to them. They react under fault current in a very distinct way. 
That one's going to react very quickly. This is going to take longer. So how do we know this as engineers? If you go into engineering, how do we know this? How do you know? How do you know it? What do you guess? Software. Software will tell you. This is called a time current curve. There's two fuses up here. Every manufacturer in the country has to make these for their components so that engineers know how the reaction is going to occur with these devices. So here is a here is a KTSR 200 amp bus from fuse. I'm going to take a fault current. I just picked one. Wherever it touches that line, it's going to trip that fuse in 0.2 seconds. That's category zero, which is a real low energy under that amount of current. Now, you come along and put in a 200 amp busman fuse. They're both 200 amps and they're both busman. One's a KTSR, one's an FRSR. They react differently. Watch how this one reacts. 10 seconds. They look identical. But the, the amount of time that it takes for the inside of that fuse to react to that fault current is dramatically different. So now it goes from 10 seconds, which is 40 calories, which will probably kill you, by changing that one fuse. Downstream, you've changed time. So why don't why don't why don't people put in fast acting fuses everywhere? Not money. There's something else that fuses and circuit breakers have to deal with. What would it be? Turn on um, surge currents. Mot motors start on. Motor, motor start. Yeah. Motor That's called inrush. So what happens is when you turn a transformer on and you turn a motor on. You're trying to start a great big chunk of steel. And what it does is called inrush current. The inrush is going to come in and it's going to confuse the device and it's going to trip it. So how are you going to be able to figure out what to put in the circuit that won't trip on inrush? I already gave the answer last time. Starts with letter S. Software. Software. <clears throat> we can see that this motor is going to start and it's going to hit that fuse right there, the amount of current, and it's going to trip in two seconds. That is a physical fact that you can see in software that you will never start that motor with that 350 amp fuse like that. Now watch what happens when we put a different fuse in the software. You're going to see this isn't going to change. Where this curve is at is going to move over. So the fuse is going to react differently. So now the fuse is, is not as sensitive to the motor. It's going to allow the motor to start. So now what engineers are trying to do is they're trying to balance this and balance this at the same time. That's difficult. That's two things at the same time that you're looking at software. People are trying to control time with all kinds of devices. If you start a motor, you have to do it in normal mode. The minute you put it in maintenance mode, if you're working on the motor and something would really short, that's going to trip very, very fast, but you'll never start the motor if it's in that, in that mode because it's going to be very sensitive to inrush current. Anybody know what selective coordination is? Or you will now. Now, if that motor falls, what comes in the building? Remember that from the dam? What comes in the building? What? Fault current. Where's it come from? Transformer. Watch. Boom, here's the transformer, here comes the fault current. It goes through your main fuse first, that one second, that one third, that one fourth, bang. Now depending on how long this takes to react is going to depend on the arc flash. Now here's the problem. Now you can imagine if this is a circuit all through a building, this building and every other building on the campus. We as engineers have got to time this the fault current goes through that fuse first. It goes through that fuse last. We have to time this upside down in milliseconds so that that will trip first and not that. Otherwise, that little motor is going to take out the entire building power. You don't want to do that. So how are you going to do this? I know you got the answer this time. What? Software. We can see it. This is going to trip first, this is going to trip second, this is going to trip third in milliseconds. We can see this. So what we do is we tell, now we're balancing arc flash, we're balancing motor starting, 
and we're da balancing selective coordination. If you screw this up in a hospital, you will kill people. Because if that trips on an elevator, and it drops that out, if you drop out a critical circuit, kill people. It has to be perfect. Now, you can't change anything here. If an electrician comes along and changes that fuse, which they do, they just screwed this up. So when I tell electricians, you don't change fuses, you better not. You better put the identical fuse back in again. There are electronic breakers that control time. Some have dials that literally, when you turn the dial, it moves this line. So we can actually change a setting on this right here by changing these pickup settings on the breaker. If, if we don't set it, if we set it wrong, this line will move over here. Which means that that's not gonna, that's gonna trip first. So this is the kind of thing you get in engineering that is power related. It's a big job. Somebody's gotta figure this out. Think you can take them? Okay. Now, what do you think? That's electricity. Remember. This is what you're working on. That's not what's feeding this building, I'll tell you that right now. But there is fault current in your house. Hard flash does not occur as your house. It has to be three phases to occur. What happens at your house is shock. But if you're around, if you go down the power path of engineering, you're gonna to have to understand this stuff because that's how critical it is because there's people's lives at, at, at stake. Why do, why do high voltage wires, why are they small and uninsulated? Why do they run the voltage up? You can't answer. Why do they put the voltage so high? 138,000, 500,000 volts. Why? They run the voltage up because now you need less current. So the amps go down. If the amps go down, what does it do to the wire? Less fuel heating. Huh? Less heating. So less power loss. No. Physically smaller wire? No. What did you just say? I think you said it right. What did you think? Physically smaller. Physically smaller, smaller wire. Yeah, okay. smaller gauge wire. That one. Higher current, excuse me, higher voltage, smaller current, smaller wire. So the wires that you see on that substation are about this big around. The minute they come in this building, the voltage goes down, the current goes up. Now you have to have five sets of wire this big around because the current has changed. So that's why high voltage wires, because the voltage drop is one issue, and the other because of the current. They want to, they want to run it up as far as they possibly can. You got any horror stories? You used to work on high voltage stuff. Any horror stories? A couple fatalities. I wouldn't be a lineman on the bed. See, I was an inside wireman. The people that are dumb, they go to be linemen. <laughs> Number one, it's high voltage, who wants that? Number two, you never do it on a sunny day, right? It's gonna be wind blowing, snow, trees falling all over the place, and you guys are worried about your beer getting hot in the refrigerator, and he's out on a pole trying to fix it. So linemen, they earn their money. They really do. Okay. Any questions about electricity? Everybody wants to be an electrician now? Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate your time. It's a sobering thought. It's sobering all the way around. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you for uh, listening to that. Hopefully, if you um, 